Hey everyone, today we're diving into a really intense and important moment in history, the Indian Massacre of 1622. This was a major event that took place in the early days of the Virginia colony, and it was a massive coordinated attack by the Powhatan Confederacy, led by their chief, Opkanakanov, along with his brother Apichapam. It resulted in the deaths of 347 colonists, which was nearly a third of the colony's population at the time. So how did this all happen? Well, the Powhatan Confederacy carefully planned this attack, and it hit the colonists fast and without much warning. Only one settlement, Jamestown, got a heads up and managed to defend itself. The rest, they were caught completely off guard. Out of about 1,250 English settlers in the area, 347 were killed in just a few hours, mostly before noon on March 22, 1622. But that wasn't the end. In the following months, even more colonists died due to malnutrition, disease, and ongoing conflicts with the native tribes. The attack wasn't just about taking lives, it also wrecked the colony's food supply and left the settlers struggling to survive. At this point, you might be wondering why the Powhatan Confederacy would go after the colonists so brutally, especially since they had a relatively peaceful relationship for a while. After all, since 1614, after the First Powhatan War ended, there was peace. Natives and colonists were trading, visiting each other's villages, and even building personal relationships. But under the surface, things weren't so friendly. Over the years, the colonists had been expanding further and further out from Jamestown, taking more native land, mistreating the people, stealing food, and allowing their livestock to trample on native crops and sacred lands. Apkanakanov, the leader behind this attack, had three clear goals. He wanted to show the military strength of the Powhatan people, crush the spirits of the English settlers, and hopefully, make them so miserable that they'd pack up and head back to England. Now the first two objectives worked out, the English were devastated. But instead of retreating, they dug in and fought back, leading to what's now called the Second Powhatan War, which lasted from 1622 to 1626. The English won that war, and from that point on, things only got worse for the Powhatans. Trade between the two sides dwindled, and more native land was snatched up for English tobacco plantations. Apkanakanov wasn't done yet though. In 1644, he launched another attack, starting the Third Powhatan War, but this time it didn't end well for him. He was eventually captured and killed, and with his death, the Powhatan Confederacy came to an end. The Treaty of 1640 not only marked the end of the war but also set the stage for the reservation system for Native Americans in the area. This massacre also had a ripple effect, influencing how the English dealt with Native American tribes in other parts of the colonies. The policies and strategies they developed during this time played a role in future conflicts like the Pequot War and King Philip's War in New England. But let's take a step back for a moment and look at Jamestown and the Powhatan Confederacy before things got so bloody. Jamestown was the first permanent English settlement in North America, founded in 1607. And at first, the local Powhatan tribes didn't mind having the English there. They figured these strange newcomers could be useful, maybe as allies against their enemies or even against the Spanish, who had already started colonizing parts of Central and South America. The English settlers were pretty helpless at the beginning, so Chief Powhatan, the head of the Confederacy, even had his people give them food and supplies. But the colonists didn't really learn how to survive on their own. They just kept expecting help. At first, things were okay especially when Captain John Smith built a working relationship with Chief Powhatan. But by 1609, things started to sour. The colonists were getting greedy, taking more land and food, and basically treating the native tribes as if they were under the rule of the English king. This didn't sit well with Chief Powhatan, and he eventually ordered his people to stop helping the settlers. What followed was one of the hardest periods in Jamestown's history, known as the Starving Time. The colonists were trapped in their settlement, unable to venture out for food, and as a result, 
over 80% of them died. When new leaders, Sir Thomas Gates and Lord de la War, arrived in 1610, they completely changed the approach. They didn't want to compromise with the natives anymore, and that's what sparked the First Powhatan War, a brutal conflict with a lot of back-and-forth raids and casualties on both sides. And now let's talk about what's known as the Peace of Pocahontas. This was an eight-year period of relative calm between the colonists and the Powhatan Confederacy, following the end of the First Powhatan War. So at this point, the native tribes were far better at guerrilla warfare. They were quick, mobile, and their bow and arrows could be fired much faster than the colonists' slow-loading muskets. The colonists, on the other hand, had a huge advantage in sheer numbers. Even though many of them were being killed, more and more kept arriving from England, while the native tribes didn't have that kind of endless supply of people. As the colonists pushed further inland, they'd attack native villages, wipe out the people, and then fortify the land for themselves. This not only took away valuable resources from the natives, but also pushed the tribes further from their own territories, creating a bigger buffer between the English and native settlements. Meanwhile, more colonists and heavier artillery, like cannons, were arriving, and one of these settlers was John Rolfe. He arrived in 1610 with the new governor, Sir Thomas Gates, bringing along some hybrid tobacco seeds. He experimented with these and soon turned tobacco into the cash crop that made him and the colony wealthy. By 1,600 feet, Rolfe was a rich man with his own plantation across from the Henriquez colony. But let's backtrack a bit because one of the key events that led to peace was the kidnapping of Pocahontas. In 1613, Sir Samuel Argyll, who was in charge at the time, captured Pocahontas, the daughter of Chief Powhatan, and held her hostage at Henricus. Chief Powhatan agreed to the ransom demands, sending the colonists the weapons, tools, and prisoners they asked for. However, Argyll claimed the chief hadn't lived up to the deal and kept Pocahontas captive. During her time in captivity, she converted to Christianity and took the name Rebecca. She eventually married John Rolfe in 1614, with both Chief Powhatan and the colonial leaders approving of the marriage. This marked the end of the First Powhatan War and led to what we now call the Peace of Pocahontas. For the next eight years, things were mostly calm. Trade between the natives and the colonists grew, and for the most part, both sides respected land agreements. But peace was fragile, and tensions were still simmering under the surface. In 1616, Pocahontas, Rolfe, and their young son Thomas sailed to England to promote the colony and secure more investment. Sadly, Pocahontas died in 1617 on their return journey, and her son stayed behind in England with Rolfe's brother. Chief Powhatan, still grieving the loss of his daughter, managed to keep the peace in honor of his grandson. But he eventually stepped down from leadership, and his brother Apichapam took over. However, Apichapam wasn't as powerful or respected as Powhatan's other half-brother, Apkanakanov, who would soon rise to lead the Confederacy. Now here's where things start to shift toward the massacre, when Pocahontas had traveled to England, she brought along members of her family and tribe, including her brother-in-law, Tamakomo. Tamakomo was a counselor to Chief Powhatan and was tasked with observing the English in their own land. According to colonial accounts, Tamakomo wasn't impressed and made it clear that the English couldn't be trusted. These same colonial sources though claim that Tamakomo was silenced by a delegation of colonists when he tried to present his findings. Whether or not that part is true is up for debate, but it's likely that Apkanakanov trusted Tamakomo's warnings and began preparing for the future. At this time the relationship between the colonists and the native tribes seemed better than ever. The colonial records from 1621 show that things were going so well that no one could have predicted the violence that was about to unfold. Apkanakanov and his people continued to interact with the English settlers, and even just two days before the massacre, natives were helping guide colonists through the woods, keeping up the appearance of peace. In fact, the natives had borrowed English boats to travel across the river to secretly plan the attack that would soon shake the colony to its core. 
By this point John Rolfe had remarried and was managing his plantation, making frequent trips across the river to Henriquez. At the same time the colonial government, known as the House of Burgesses, was dealing with conflicts between colonists and natives. In 1621, a native war chief named Nemetanu was killed by the colonists after being accused of murdering one of their own. When Apkanakanuf learned of his chief's death, he didn't retaliate immediately, claiming that Nemetanu had been justly killed. However, whether he truly believed that is still debated. This event, combined with the growing tension, set the stage for the massacre that would soon follow. So, around this time, Apkanakanuf and his brother Apichapam took on war names. This was a clear sign they were preparing for something big. They gathered the tribes together under the guise of honoring the memory of Wahan Seneca, their former chief. To the colonists, this seemed like just another ceremony, nothing to worry about. But in hindsight, this gathering was likely a cover for planning and coordinating the attack. The natives had been quietly gathering information, where the colonists would be, who was working in the fields, what times they were most vulnerable. They studied every detail to make sure their strike was swift and deadly. Then the morning of March 22, 1622, Good Friday, began just like any other. The colonists went about their usual routines, working on their farms, tending their shops, completely unaware of what was about to unfold. Early that morning, native warriors quietly entered the European settlements. They knocked on doors asking to come inside. To the colonists, these were familiar faces, people they had traded with, shared meals with. Many of the natives entered unarmed and even accepted food or drink. But then, without warning, they grabbed whatever they could find, a knife, a stew pot, or even the colonists' own guns, and turned them into weapons. They struck fast, killing entire families before anyone even realized what was happening. Houses were set ablaze, and settlements across the region went up in flames. The attack was so coordinated and ruthless that many colonists didn't even know they were under attack until it was too late. At the last minute, a few natives, who had relationships with some of the settlers, warned them about the massacre. These warnings helped Jamestown prepare and defend itself but it wasn't enough to save everyone. By the time it was over, around 325 colonists were dead, though some accounts put the number at 347. Henriquez, including the college and hospital there, was completely destroyed, and every colonist in that area was killed. Even John Rolfe is presumed to have died in the attack. The colonists were absolutely shocked. They had faced small skirmishes before, but nothing on this scale. The sheer brutality and coordination of the massacre left them stunned and unable to act for a while. Now, here's where Apkanakanov's strategy takes an interesting turn. He could have easily wiped out the remaining settlers. Those outside of Jamestown had no defenses, and even Jamestown itself could have been set on fire, with the survivors picked off as they fled. But instead, he stopped. He didn't launch another attack. Why? Well, in his mind, he thought the colonists would simply pack up and leave. In Native American culture, if a tribe had suffered such a devastating blow, they would typically retreat and abandon the land. But Apkanakanuf had miscalculated. He didn't fully understand the European mindset. Instead of leaving, the colonists regrouped. They rebuilt, and though many of their crops had been destroyed in the attacks, they were forced to continue trading with the same tribes that had just slaughtered them. It wasn't out of forgiveness, but necessity. Mann, the historian, notes that after the massacre, another 700 settlers died, not directly from attacks, but because the chaos had disrupted their spring planting, leaving them with even less food than usual. On top of that, the Virginia Company sent over more settlers, around a thousand, but without any food supplies, making the situation even more desperate. The natives, however, were still far better at guerrilla warfare, and the reinforcements from England couldn't make up for that. So, the colonists resorted to trickery. They invited the tribal chiefs to a peace conference, where they poisoned the wine. Once the chiefs were incapacitated, the colonists turned on their bodyguards and attendants, killing over 200 of them. 
The Second Powhatan War dragged on until 1626, when Apkanakana finally sued for peace. Even then, hostilities simmered well into the 1630s. By June of 1620, news of the massacre had reached England. King James I was furious. He dissolved the Virginia Company, taking control of the colony himself under a royal charter. Whether the king was genuinely concerned about protecting the settlers or more interested in controlling the profitable tobacco trade is anyone's guess, but either way, Virginia was now under direct royal control. On March 22, 1624, exactly two years after the massacre, the House of Burgesses declared that this date would be remembered as a solemn holiday. The massacre became a defining story for the colony. New arrivals to Virginia were told the horrifying details by the survivors, and these stories were passed down, ensuring that the massacre became part of the collective memory. This only deepened the mistrust and animosity between the settlers and the native tribes. This narrative of the savage native attack became a justification for future violence. Decades later, when conflicts like the Pequot War in New England or King Philip's War in 1675 erupted, the colonists drew from the stories of the 1622 massacre. The natives were seen as untrustworthy, dangerous, and always ready to turn on the settlers, even if relations seemed peaceful on the surface. But the truth, as we now understand it, is more complicated. The massacre of 1622 wasn't an unprovoked attack by a savage enemy. It was a carefully planned response to years of mistreatment, land theft and violence by the English colonists. The natives had seen their land taken, their people killed, and their way of life threatened by settlers who treated them as less than human. The massacre, from the native perspective, was not an act of savagery, it was an act of survival. By the end of the 17th century, the colonists had continued to justify their expansion into native lands by invoking the 622 massacre. The stories of that event were used to paint the natives as the aggressors, conveniently ignoring the atrocities committed by the settlers themselves. 